Uh, good afternoon. My name is Stephen Howes. I uh, work at the Development Policy Centre here at the ANU, and um, my uh, guest today is Stephanie Cobus Campbell, who is the uh, head of the Oil Search Foundation uh, in Papua New Guinea, and has worked on PNG for a long time, uh, including as uh, head of the Australian Aid Program there. And we've just been in a uh, in a session along with our, our colleague Bal Kama, uh, really about uh, the future of PNG. And, uh, and what Australia can do uh, in regards to its close neighbour and important friend PNG. I guess, Steph, one of the you know, key messages from that session was, was that very importance of PNG to Australia for a whole host of, uh, of reasons. Um, but yet, on the other hand, the sort of the very little interest that Australia and, in fact, many Australians uh, take in PNG. So why do you think that is and what can we do about it? Yeah, and let me just emphasize it's something that for the last 18 years I've been working on Papua New Guinea and I have been trying in every way that I can to raise interest in this country that I have come to absolutely love. It is, as you would know, Stephen, one of the more fascinating places in the entire world to work and a country on our doorstep and a country we have shared history. Um, so why, for example, is it easier for me to raise money for an orphanage in Africa than it is to raise money in a philanthropic sense for this country on our doorstep when there's so many reasons we should care. And I think part of it is there's this reputation, the media likes a story and the media tends to publish the negative and not the positive. So I can tell you a million good stories that they could put in, but it's really when there's something that kind of dreadful that happens will go into the paper. So people form an impression of Papua New Guinea from the media that is not the impression that I would like them to gain if I was telling the story. So how we can work to just get more awareness of, you know, of course there's challenges in PNG and of course there's security issues in PNG, but at the same time there are many wonderful, incredible stories that just need to be shared. I think we need to invest more in schools. I think we need to invest more in universities. I think we need to invest more in getting Australians to Papua New Guinea. Um, I remember, well, I've, I've worked with a number of doctors, for example, who were in Papua New Guinea in the 60s and the 70s and had the most incredible time there as young doctors. They're just working. And so they have these fond memories that have lasted a lifetime. And I think you will know if you go to PNG, there's this thing they don't warn you about. They tell you about um, mosquitoes and they tell you about rascals and they tell you about potholes. They don't tell you about this bug called Papua New Guinea that bites you and you are infected for the rest of your life with this incredible love for the country. Um, and these people had it. So how do we get more people in to do their internships in Papua New Guinea, to go and teach there for a little while, to go work in inline positions in government um, and to really you know, get this kind of love and interest of this, this incredible country on our doorstep. So I think there's a lot more around that. I think it does need a bit more of a strategy. I think it needs some leadership um, and I think it takes all of us who love PNG just continuing to do what we can to get those messages out. Mm. I mean, there's no shortage of uh, challenges and problems when it comes to PNG but one of the you know, more positive uh, aspects to come out from that session I thought was around the potential of the private sector and around the private sector partnering with the government uh, to achieve social objectives as well as economic ones. I know that's something you've been involved in in your work through OSF, so perhaps tell us a bit about that and, and how you think that can work in PNG. And let me tell you there's two real takeaway positives for me. One, civil society, so let me just answer that first because I think this is important to understand and you know to some extent maybe the private sector is part of civil society, but one is civil society and when I first started working in PNG in the year 2000, we really didn't have a strong and vibrant civil society and that has certainly grown over time to where there are a number of homegrown institutions of Papua New Guineans wanting to change things for Papua New Guinea. And for me, that's the hope. That's, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning to work with those amazing Papua New Guinean leaders who want to see change and I think that's really exciting. But with that I think the private sector is also this sleeping giant in terms of how we can engage the private sector to really play a significant role. And there's a few ways that that can happen. One is money. Um, I work for a the largest company, PNG Oil Search, and they've put 100 million Australian dollars over five years to make things better in a social development sense. And that is my task as head of the Oil Search Foundation, is to go and achieve real and sustainable results for Papua New Guinea. And that's what I have to report against. I have to show that that money has achieved results. And so we're doing work in a public-private setting. 
um, and we're, we're doing work in a very innovative way with a range of partners in health and education and women's empowerment and protection. So for example in Hella, um, we've been working with the Hella Provincial Health Authority. We are um, supporting them to take a partnership approach to really shake things up and do things differently through this partnership approach that works with all levels of government. At the national level of government we're working to change the way that you can deliver health services, so the way in which the money flows, and we've already had through working um, with government a huge success in that money is now going directly to the health service and it's bypassing the provincial government where it was getting stuck, so that's been already a huge success. We're working with them to change the ways that the um, health authorities can use their money, so for example, they um, we want to get to a stage where instead of always having to use government health workers, they might be able to outsource some of that to a church or to an NGO who could potentially do it better. So we're also working with them to say we're spending our money through the private sector, we're spending government's money, we're spending 100% of that money towards where it needs to go through helping to build good governance. We're bringing in other private sector partners, so through that we've had Exxon come in and wanting to spend money. We've had Santos give us a um, million US dollars to build an accident emergency ward. And we're spending um, the minister's money as well through that. So we've had Petrus Thomas give us 200,000 Kina to redevelop the hospital in Korba. We've had the governor give us um, 100 million for the hospital. So we're bringing all that money together from all these different resources with new ways of doing business, with some private sector kind of innovation and in how you kind of get things done and some of the governance aspects of running boards, for example, and the leadership side of things. We're pulling all that together with shared indicators to say, how many kids do we immunize? How many women will access supervised deliveries? How many communities will have clean and safe um, water supply and therefore see a reduction in diarrhea and therefore see a reduction in children dying from preventable diseases? And we are measuring our success as a partnership against that. And I think that's something that the private sector has been able to spark, just bringing in some of our um, knowledge and um, skill sets um, and then linking that with a number of other players. And of course the Australian government as well has now come on board to help to fund some of this as well, so it's very exciting. Another issue that came up, you know, both as a negative and a positive was um, domestic violence and violence against women. You know, we all know it's a big problem in PNG, yeah. but it's also one where you mentioned uh, the aid program has had some success. And so what do you see there and, and what do you see as the way forward on that on that issue? I think that goes back first to my point of the aid program having broad success in helping to stimulate civil society and I, I do think that our aid program should take a lot of credit for that. I think this is something they should really be sharing some lessons on how that was done, their investment in churches, their investment in local NGOs, etc. Um, I think that that in itself is a real success story and out of that I think is following this conversation around family and sexual violence. So when I first started working in PNG in 2000, you couldn't have the conversation. It was everywhere though. You'd see it on the side of the street, you come to work and deal with your staff, you know, experiencing family and sexual violence. Um, it affected kind of everything that, that you would try to do. And, you know, while sadly that's still the case, there's still high levels of violence. In 2000, you just could not talk about it. I remember going to Western Province and meeting this incredible um, woman who had left her husband and had the courage to do that. She'd gone to the hospital with her 10-month baby to try to get away from him. She wanted a change. She didn't want to go back to him. She was scared for her child's life. She was scared for her life. And she said to me, can you please, please, please help me? And there was nothing I could do for her at that time. Absolutely nothing. Uh, there was no services to send her to. The police weren't going to help her. I wasn't allowed to you know, talk about it. Um, but you fast forward now, and whilst there still needs to be greater services, and we have an another um, extremely, well, we're working with you on it, Stephen, um, extremely exciting public-private partnership that's going to help to build even better services in Moresby. But now you can talk about it. You can get out and have these conversations. Papua New Guineans do not want the levels of, of family and sexual violence in their own families, in their own communities, in their workplaces, in their country. They want to see this change. So it's not now this donor-driven initiative from the outside, which in 2000 it was. It's not donors coming and saying, you need to have you know gender equality, you need to treat your women better. It's Papua New Guineans saying, we have a problem and it's Australians saying, hey, we Australians also have a problem and let's work together. I mean, I think one of the most powerful things we did was bring Rosie Batty, for example, to PNG and she was able to, um, you know, kind of say, I'm not here to preach to you. I'm here because my partner killed my son in Australia. I'm here to share a problem with you. And it's working together um, to share that problem with PNG driving their own agenda in a Papua New Guinea way and um, that's pretty exciting.
we're at a turning point. Terrific. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen.